Good evening. I hope you had a really good view of the partial eclipse of the sun, but that's the last partial solar eclipse to be visible from Britain, I'm afraid, for some time. The Hubble Space Telescope continues to send back amazing pictures. Here's one of the latest. This is a deep sky picture, but a picture with a difference. It shows galaxies around 11,000 million light years away. And these are fairly small galaxies, and they're closer together than galaxies generally are. There are quite a number of them in an area only about two million light years across, and that's only about as far as this between ourselves and the Andromeda galaxy. And it may well be that these are building blocks which will gradually merge to build up larger galaxies. So the Hubble certainly is proving its worth. And here's another picture, this time of Jupiter, taken from Hubble. And it shows Jupiter itself together with the volcanic satellite Io, there you can see it, and the black point is Io's shadow. And look at Io, and you'll see surface details there. That, of course, is a very volcanic world indeed. And now, with Hubble, we can actually monitor the Ionian volcanoes going off all the time. This picture is also of Jupiter, but it wasn't taken by Hubble. This was taken by the IUE, or International Ultraviolet Explorer Satellite, and it shows Jovian Aurorae, together with the four main satellites, Io, of course, and also Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And in a way, that's rather a sad picture. The IUE, as a marvelous satellite, has been operating now ever since the 1970s, and it's still doing magnificent scientific work. And simply to save money, it is being switched off. And I think that's a very sad reflection on the way in which we do spend our money. But I want now to turn to something well beyond our own solar system. In the year 1781, the French astronomer Charles Messier drew up a catalogue of star clusters and nebulae. Not because he was interested in them, frankly he wasn't. He was a comet hunter, and he kept on confusing comets with star clusters and nebulae. So finally, he catalogued the clusters and nebulae merely as objects to avoid and we still use the Messier, or M, numbers. And it so happens that number one in his catalogue is of special interest. It's in the constellation of Taurus the Bull, not very far away from the third magnitude star, Zeta Tauri. M1, we call it the Crab Nebula. And here, in fact, is a photograph of the area, the lovely star cluster of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. See that now in the eastern sky after dark? The red Aldebaran, with the V-shaped cluster of the Hyades, and there is Zeta Tauri, and very close to Zeta is the Crab Nebula, which you can just see with good binoculars and is very easy in a small telescope. Here's a small scale picture of it, and here is a detailed one. And you can see what it is, a patch of expanding gas 6,000 light years away, and we know what it was. It is in fact the remnant of a supernova. In the year 1054, a brilliant new star was seen to flare up in the constellation of the Bull and became so bright it could be seen with the naked eye even in broad daylight. It was studied by Chinese and Korean astronomers and also seen, we think, by the North American Indians and shown in this old painting. We call it the rabbit, and there, we think, is the Crab Nebula. Well, it lasted for some time, but gradually it faded away, and when it dropped below naked eye visibility, of course it was lost, and only in telescopic times did we find what it had been left behind, the remnant we now call the Crab Nebula. And supernovae are of great importance to astronomers. At this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. Chris Kitchen with the University of Hertfordshire. Welcome back, Chris. Hello, Patrick. Well, exactly why are supernovae so important? Well, it has been said that uh, astronomy divides into the astronomy of the Crab Nebula mm -hmm. and the astronomy of everything else, and that of the two, the former is the more important. That's clearly something of an exaggeration, but nonetheless, it does show just how interesting and fascinating astronomers find supernovae and their remnants. Now, the Crab Nebula is probably the best-known supernova remnant, but it's by no means typical. Most supernova remnants are shells, and we see them as rings and wisps of cloud. Moreover, in the uh, optical region, we see relatively few supernovae. Most of them are seen from their radio images and their X-ray images. Why is the Crab so different, then? Well, probably because close to its centre, there is the remains, there is a faint star which is the remains of the ultra-compressed core of the star that exploded to produce the nebula. That star is a pulsar, and it flashes on and off 33 times a second. Here we can see it just above the central star slowed down considerably. The star uh, at the centre is extremely dense. On the Earth, if we, if we took 50,000 tonnes, that is about the mass of a supertanker, it would be compressed down to the size of a grain of sugar. 
uh, by the time it was on the pulsar. Amazing. Now, pulsars are thought to be produced inside supernovae, but only a fraction of the known gaseous supernova remnants have pulsars inside them. And it's the pulsar inside the Crab Nebula that supplies the energy to keep the inner parts go glowing uh, rather than just the outer parts as in most other supernova remnants. How can we be so sure that the Crab Nebula really is the remnant of the supernova of 1054? Well, firstly, it is in the right part of the sky. More significantly, over a period of time, we can see it expanding. Uh, the outer parts of the nebula uh, move outwards by about one second of arc every seven or eight years. At the nebula's distance of six and a half thousand light years, that corresponds to an expansion velocity of 1,200 kilometers a second. The nebula is just over four minutes of arc across, and therefore it will have taken about a thousand years to reach its present size, which takes us back to 1054 or thereabouts. If the crab is powered by a pulsar, what about the power of other supernova remnants? Well, the first clue to the energies of supernova remnants comes from looking at the light curves of supernovae themselves. These decrease after the peak, uh, showing initially a half-life of around about six or seven days. Later on, the rate of decrease slows, and they take about uh, 70 or 80 days to decrease in intensity by a factor of two. Now, an exponential decrease of that sort suggests very strongly radioactivity as the energy source, and that ties in very well with theories of supernovae. Theories of supernovae suggest that after the explosion, something like a solar mass, that is 300,000 times the mass of the Earth, is left in the form of the radioactive isotope nickel-56. And this decays with a half-life of six days. And it decays into the, another radioactive isotope, cobalt-56, which in turn has a half-life of 77 days, and finally ends up as the stable isotope, iron-56. Uh, the reality of this has recently been uh, demonstrated by the direct detection of the cobalt in the remains of the supernova that went off in 1987 in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Now, the short half-life of the nickel means that its energy is deposited into the supernova remnant very, very quickly, and it forms a small, hot sphere of gas right at the centre. This sphere is unstable, and it sends out long protuberances of hot, nickel-rich material into the rest of the remnant. These nickel bullets mix the products of the nuclear reactions from the supernova into the whole of the supernova remnant. By the half-life period, of course, we mean that after that particular period, half of the original substance has decayed, so it's a measure of the rate of decay. That's and right. If, and if cobalt 50 has such a short half-life, then there must be a fairly brief period after which there's almost nothing left. Therefore, what about the continuing energy of supernova remnants? Well, to get a clue to that, we must look at supernova remnants in a rather different way. That is through uh, a Polaroid filter. Now, most people are familiar with Polaroid through the sunglasses that... Uh, uh, abound around the place. Um, if we look at the nebula through a Polaroid filter oriented vertically, we get the red image here. With the filter oriented uh, horizontally, we get the green image, and we see the two combined here, showing the differences in polarization very clearly. What's the significance of the polarization? Well, polarization of this sort originates from synchrotron radiation. That is radiation that is produced by charged particles, like electrons, spiralling around magnetic fields. Most of the energy of the uh, supernova remnants originates, therefore, from electrons moving close to the speed of light and following tortuous paths around the tangled magnetic fields left behind after the supernova explosion. To begin with, the energy of the electrons is just that left over from the explosion itself. But later, they can be accelerated to close to the speed of light as they pass through the shock front where the supernova remnant meets the interstellar medium. We've been talking very largely about the Crab Nebula, which I agree is exceptionally interesting. But what about other supernova remnants? There are plenty of them. Well, the study of supernovae and remnants is dominated really by two objects, the Crab Nebula, of course, and the supernova that went off in 1987 in the Large Magellanic Cloud. The significance of that is that even though it is 170,000 light years away from us, nonetheless it is still the nearest supernova to have gone off and to have been observed since before the invention of the telescope. 
Supernovae generally occur at the rate of about five or ten in a large spiral galaxy uh, every century. And we can see one here in the galaxy NGC 4536, just above the nucleus, that went off some time ago. Within our own galaxy, uh, our view of the galaxy is restricted by interstellar dust clouds, and we only see about 10% of the stars. Nonetheless, we should have expected to see three or four supernovae in the last few centuries. And we've been rather unlucky that the last visible supernova was that seen by Kepler in 1604. The supernova in the Large Magellanic Cloud, 1987, has not had much time to form its remnant, but nonetheless we can, from radio observations, still detect it. And it shows a roughly spherical shell of gas expanding outwards at some 30,000 kilometres a second. By the end of this century, that rapidly expanding shell of gas will catch up with slower gas emitted before the star exploded, and the radio emissions will become very much stronger. In fact, supernova remnants generally are usually very strong radio sources. Uh, a supernova in Cassiopeia, uh, producing the Cassiopeia A radio source, is one of the strongest in the sky, despite seeing, being some 9,000 light years away. It's the remains of a supernova that, had we been able to see it, uh, we would have seen about 200 years ago. And of course, we didn't see it because of the dust. That was a great pity. But quite apart from the intrinsic interest of supernovae, what about their wider significance? Well, they have a lot of significance, and indeed significance for every one of us on the Earth. Had it not been for a supernova and its remnant occurring some four and a half or five thousand million years ago, uh, the solar system and the Earth and ourselves might never have f been formed. Uh, the expanding remnants of a supernovae blow huge bubbles into the interstellar medium. And these bubbles, along with the bubbles around hot stars, touch and overlap each other so that the interstellar medium resembles more the film of soap in a bowl of soap suds rather than a nice smooth medium that people had expected until fairly recently. Frequently a supernova will occur whilst it is still embedded inside a dense nebula in which stars are being formed. The expanding supernova remnant will then compress the nebula and cause new stars to form all around its edge, as we can see here in the association in Canis Major. Just such a process is thought to have precipitated the formation of the Sun and the solar system. Then there are the cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are particles, uh, electrons, protons, atomic nuclei, moving close to the speed of light and permeating most of the galaxy. When they collide with nuclei high in the Earth's atmosphere, they produce much of the background radiation which bathes us all. And it's that radiation which uh, produces mutations and which drives evolution. Without that background radiation, uh, life would probably still just be clever molecules mm. inside uh, in the oceans on the Earth and not have reached uh, ourselves as it has. The, uh, the cosmic rays also produce uh, carbon-14 from the nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere, and that is a radioactive isotope which archaeologists use to date their finds. Now, the huge velocities and energies of cosmic rays are thought to be produced inside supernovae and supernova remnants via what's called the Fermi process. That's named after Enrico Fermi, who for first thought up the idea. Charged particles are reflected backwards and forwards between magnetic fields. When the magnetic fields are approaching each other, the particles gain energy. When they're moving apart, the particles lose energy. But on average, more energy is gained than lost, and so the cosmic ray particles are driven to very, very close indeed to the speed of light. So all in all, we owe a great deal to supernovae. Well, because, um, anything else? There is indeed. Uh, when the universe originated in the Big Bang, um, soon afterwards there was only hydrogen and helium. Uh, we on the Earth uh, contain only relatively little hydrogen and helium. The uh, heavier elements are made from hydrogen and helium, and by the time the Earth was being born, some four and a half thousand million years ago, around about 2% of the hydrogen and helium had been converted into the heavier elements. Now, the heavy ele elements are made inside stars. The Sun, for example, is currently converting hydrogen to helium, and it will go on to produce carbon, oxygen, and neon. However, those elements will remain locked inside the Sun, just as in most case, other cases, the stars uh, producing heavier elements will trap them and not allow them out into the universe.
However, in the precursor to the supernova, all the elements up to iron are produced. And then during the supernova explosion itself, the elements beyond iron, that is gold, lead, uranium and so forth, are produced in the explosion. And most importantly, those elements are then blasted out into space, into the supernova remnant, uh, during the explosion itself. We have here an example of the sort of stuff I'm talking about. It is, of course, now solid, and the hydrogen and helium has disappeared. But this is a meteorite, the Elende meteorite, which landed in Chile. And it is, in fact, some 200 million years older than the Earth. 200 million years older than the Earth. Quite incredible. Indeed. And it's the sort of thing that supernovae produce. It's only in supernova remnants, therefore, and uh, the material that we need to make the Earth, and indeed ultimately ourselves, is produced and then blasted out into space. And it's due to a supernova and its remnant occurring some 200 million years before the formation of the solar system that we're here to be able to be talking about it at all. Well, Chris, as you say, the last naked eye supernova in our galaxy flared up in 1604. We've not had one since. I wonder when we have the next one. Uh, tomorrow, or next year, or 10,000 years? We can't tell. But there are one or two candidates, aren't there? And I'm thinking of the far southern star, Eta Carini. You can't see it from here, it is too far south. A very massive star, at least a million times more luminous than our sun, and highly unstable. What do you make of Eta Carini as a supernova remnant? Well, I think it's an excellent place to look. You'll have, of course, to move south of the equator, uh, but if you then keep an eye on it for the next thousand years, I think you've got a very good chance, indeed, of seeing a supernova occurring there. Well, at 6,000 light years, it would be truly magnificent. And I think, you know, most astronomers would be very glad to have the chance of studying a supernova in our own galaxy, always provided it wasn't too close. Indeed. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And now, much nearer home. Every mid-November, around the 17th, the Earth goes through the Leonid meteor stream and we have a shower of shooting stars. Not usually very, very rich, but it may be rich in 1998, it should be rich in 1999, and it just may be rich this year. And there's certainly time for meteor observers to be very much on the alert. And we'd like your help. If you want to know about the paths, the brilliances, the tracks of the Leonid meteors round about the 17th. And if you'd like to help, we'll provide you with an inf information pack. If you'd like to get that, then send a large stamp to desk envelope, and I say large, please, to Leonid Watch 96, PO Box 7, London W5 2GQ. We can't promise you a major shower, but there just may be, and it's certainly worthwhile watching. Also, if you want the latest astronomical information, then dial up our information line, 0891 800 Also, it is now newsletter time. If you write the latest newsletter, then send your stamp to desk envelope to Newsletter number 63, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W127TS. Now, next month, we're going to stay within the solar system. The red planet Mars is always very much in the news. It has been recently. But later on this year, no less than three new spacecraft are going to be launched towards it, two American and one Russian. And we hope that when they get there, they'll tell us a great deal more about Mars than we know now. And Mars is always of special interest to us. We're going to talk about Mars next month. And I'm going to be joined by one of NASA's principal scientific investigators and a very old friend of the sky at night, Dr. Peter Catamole. So we'll be back next month talking about Mars. And until then, good night. <laughs>